Mike's on Mike, a conversation about politics, government, and Jacksonville with 50-year opinion leaders Mike Hightower, Mike Tolbert, and award-winning broadcaster and longtime political observer Mike Miller. Hello, everybody, and welcome again to Mike's on Mike, another episode for this week. Mike Hightower is with me here in the studio. Mike Tolbert is back at his farm. And uh, once again, as always, uh, this episode of Mike's on Mike is brought to you by the Jacksonville Historical Society, which is going to be located in the Jacksonville History Center. And our thanks to Alan Bliss and all the fine donors who are keeping this program on the air. Thank you all. Thank you. Today, we don't have a guest in the studio. It's just the three of us jabbing away. On two completely different topics, by the way. The first concerns a meeting that was held recently by the Jacksonville City Council Finance Committee where members discussed, or in some cases attacked, the mayor's awarding of a single-source contract to Mike Langton Consulting for grant writing and for lobbying services. But the specific target of this council or committee meeting was actually a contract employee working for Langton, and his name is Stephen Dare. Dare, who's now 59 years old, was 21 at a time when he had trouble with the law, which I'm going to get into in just a few minutes. Many of us, most of you probably know Stephen from one vocation or another, very well known, very well liked, very talented journalist, by the way, along with being just a very fine fellow. And with that, Mike Tobert, why don't you kick this off? Well, you know, Stephen is a very unusual guy. I remember the first time I met him, he, he's kind of unforgettable. Yes, uh, he I is. Went over to see, I went over to see Blair Wobleton in her Avondale shop to talk about some environmental stuff. And that's where, and that's when I met him. He was in that shop that day, and I've never forgotten that. Then several years ago, I was just curious about Stephen. He's always, he's always interested me. So I called him and I asked him if I could spend an entire day with him. I just wanted to go where he went, hear what he had to say, see who he saw, and just just get to know him better. And I did, and it was it was incredible. So I was really appalled, although I don't know that I was surprised, when I watched that finance committee meeting and saw the behavior of the chair, Nick Howlin, and Council President Ron Salem. In my mind, it was unfounded character assassination akin to the McCarthy hearings. Let's begin with this piece of video from something Chairman Howland said. When there's executive overreach, or you think there might be, even if there isn't, you should be questioning it. When there's potential misuse of taxpayer dollars, you should be questioning it. And so what this uh, session is about here is um, another issue that's arisen related to the Langton Associates contract. Um, some people have questions about contractor access uh, and background checks. I'm more focused on potential misuse of taxpayer dollars. We awarded a contract to a firm um, that we said was the only one in the city, state, and nation that can do public policy, lobbying, and grant writing. We subsequently learned that they outsource their lobbying, and now we're learning uh, with this new information that they potentially outsource um, their public policy, which leads to my questioning, and you'll see what it's about, is are, did we just do a single source contract to a company that's just doing a pass-through, uh, in which case there's even less justifications for such a contract. Mike Miller, it seems to me that Chairman, Chairman Howland is the pot calling the kettle black here. Remind us how he slipped taxpayer money for his nonprofit into the city budget. All right. Well, this is a very, it's really a very interesting story. The city of Jacksonville, and I'm taking this from an article that was written by David Bauerline from the right. Times Union. I want to give him credit for this. But they're posed, uh, poised rather to boost its financial support to $150,000 for the Northeast Florida Fire Watch Council, which is an organization that strives to stop veteran suicides and has had ties over the years with city council members Nick Howland, and Rory Diamond. Diamond, who has made veterans programs and ethics a great part of his campaign, uh, is part of the Canines for Warriors. Holland joined city council in March after winning a special election. He was the executive director of the Northeast Florida Fire Watch Council, though, until August of 2022. But while Fire Watch Council is a governmental ent entity, authorized by state law, it does have a contract through a separate nonprofit organization called the Firewatch Project Incorporated. In contrast, Firewatch Council will pay the nonprofit $175,200 to provide program and administrative services for the regional government organization, which is comprised of, of five different counties. He stepped away from the North 
East Florida Firewatch Council role on August the 15th is concentrating his work instead on the Firewatch project. But that was given, that organization was given the $150,000 by city council and did not go through the public service grants process or any other process for review when it was snuck into the budget. Correct, Mike October? I think that's absolutely correct. And, you know, in, in, in Howland, the hypocrisy is, is, is really outstanding. And, and all through that finance committee meeting, he kept beating this drum about ethics uh, and what his con real concern was here. Uh, roll that piece of video. My concern is a single source award with flimsy justification done relatively quietly um, resisting a call to rebid, almost a potential veto of a transparency bill um, and potential misuse of taxpayer dollars. Before you go on, can I just say one other thing about Stephen Dare, and that is something that people need to put into perspective. One of the reasons why Howland and others on the, on the finance committee went after Stephen was because he had a prison, he had a, a police record. Correct. Let me tell you what that police record was. In 1986, Stephen Dare pleaded no contest to a charge of lewd and lascivious behavior, which, by the way, is a second-degree misdemeanor. Now, keep in mind, lewd, uh, uh, like I said, lewd and lascivious behavior. Why was he charged with that? Because homosexuality in Jacksonville was illegal at that time. And when it was found that he had committed a homosexual act, that's when he was charged with the secondary misdemeanor. What did he get for that? When he pleaded no contest, a fine of $150 and two days in jail. That's this guy's criminal record that Holland and others are going after him for. 38 years ago. 38 years ago. And then blaming the mayor's administration for not going and getting a background check on him, which wouldn't even show it, to be honest with you. If yeah. they had done so, but he's not an employee for the city. He's an employee for a consultant, which is another reason why they did not do a background check. I think I got that right, well, Mr. Trump. The, the human resources officer for the city said a couple of things. She said, number one, they don't do background checks on consultants. They depend on the hiring firm to do that. But secondly, she said, knowing what she knows about the situation, had they done a background check, he would have passed. She said they tracked state law, and state law had it says you can get their second chances. So if you committed an offense more than three years ago, then you can pass a background check, and it happens a good bit in city government. She said not always, but a good bit it happens. And she said he Stephen would have absolutely passed a background check. Yeah, uh, go ahead. let's go back to the, the hypocrisy of what we're talking about. I thought it was interesting for Matt Carlucci pointed out at this same uh, finance meeting that Holland was criticizing the mayor for something that had been done by the council. Uh, let's remind, let me remind the council uh, through this video. Now, let me remind this council, and this is in all due respect to my friend, Council President Salem. Council President Salem asked for a council member to pick a law firm for us to approve. And I believe it was announced that that law firm has been chosen. And I don't think that vote comes before the council. I think it comes before the personnel committee. And that's, what the, way, that's the way the law says. So nothing's been done that's been wrong or illegal. But we're single sourcing. We didn't put out for an RFP or an RFQ. And I just think we need to be careful before we start pointing fingers so much because there's three or four other fingers that point right back at us. And I tell you, I am not perfect, and there ain't nobody up here perfect. And there's nobody up here that hasn't gotten into a little trouble that maybe they're glad they didn't get caught. So I think we need to leave Mr. Dare alone unless we have something specifically in mind and that would be taken up by the proper authorities. So we are doing with this law firm the same thing that the mayor's office was perfectly 
allowed to do under the previous law. Yeah, you know, Matt also spoke up in defense of Stephen Dare, somebody he's known a long, long time. I wondered if Matt, while watching that committee, I wondered how long Matt was going to sit silent uh, while all this nonsense was going on. Uh, let's play what Matt said about Stephen. Uh, I've known Mr. Dare since I was 32, 33 years old as a freshman council member. And I've known him since then. Now, I'm not perfect, and apparently he's not perfect either. But I can tell you, he's been a good friend. He's been a heck of a resource to me. This kid, I call him a kid because he used to be a kid when I first knew him. Now we're both older guys. But Mr. Dare, um, I found to be one of the brightest people, and it surprised me because he was never dressed in a coat and tie. I, you know, he was just a, just who was who Stephen Dare was. But when I say he is a great writer, he is a great writer. When I say he is smart, he is real smart. When I say he loves Jacksonville. He loves Jacksonville. And there's a cadre of people in the business community today that I could pull up here if I wanted to that would defend his abilities. It seems President Salem was hung up on the fact that after an offense that was committed 38 years ago, that Stephen Dare was allowed a security badge. Now, a security badge allows you to get into the front door of City Hall. However, they're all programmed differently depending on what your position is and where what you hold as far as your responsibilities are concerned. So Stephen, because he was part of the transition team, was able to get to the mayor's office, not into the city council's area. And that question was asked, by the way, in that hearing. He did not have access to go in there, nor did he try to. He went from basically into the front doors and up to the mayor's area where he had, a, by the way, a desk uh, in her office so that he could work there as part of the consultant program that went on. The city's human resource director, as, as Mike Tolbert just pointed out, uh, follows that state law allowing second chances. Now, keep in mind, he served as a valuable member. This is Stephen Dare of both Deegan's transition team, and it seemed to work extra time as a volunteer being hired by Langton. And once again, we reiterate, this was an offense, a second-degree misdemeanor, that happened 38 years ago. It, it, can I just... You, it, you know something? That if you Ron Salem, who's so damn sanctimonious anyhow, uh, Ron was so concerned about the security at City Hall that somebody like Stephen Dare could harm city employees or God damn, uh, excuse me, city council members. I mean, and, and the, the character assassination that went on in that meeting with those people is just abominable, and it's got to stop. I mean, Mike, you were, Mike Hightower, you were talking about this has got your politics. It, it is. Because Mayor Deegan won the election, and, and, the, and they can't stand it, and Tim Baker handled all these council members who handled da Daniel Davis, and he lost it. So they just play cop politics, got your politics, with Donna Deegan. A absolutely. And and here we are, what, eight months later, and we're still playing gotcha politics. I, You know, we are a, a community of over a million one people. We've got a lot of things going. Uh, and and for to play gotcha politics, listen, Mike, you and I have been at this, uh, what, 53, 54 years. We've been through, what, between the two of us, six administrations. You know, they are not helping to move what this community needs to be doing going forward. They're not helping us maximize or leverage all that there are good people and good things going on in this community. They are not allowing a, a collaborative community-wide agenda to go forward. They're sitting back and playing gotcha. Now, I know we're supposed to only be doing observations, but let me tell you, for between the you and I, we're doing over 100 years of political, of watching Jacksonville go through this, and it's very evident. And I can just tell you, come in about three and a half, four years when we're up for another mayor's election, let me tell you, gotcha is going to be a part of whether or not you were here to help move the city forward or you were there to help it 
move forward. And let me tell you, the people who fund those things, who fund and are great employers, they're going to remember what did these people do to help move our community forward. And, the, and let me tell you, with every action, there is a reaction and a reaction to the reaction. And I strongly suggest that some of these folks who have got a gotcha agenda may be thinking about what are you doing to help to move our community forward? Very good point. I hope you're right. You know, one of the interesting things about that meeting to me, Darnell Smith became Mayor Diggins' uh, chief of staff recently. And I think, as far as I know, this this was one of Darnell's first public appearances. He was at the committee representing the mayor. Uh, and that Mike, remind us who Darnell Smith is. <laughs> Thank you. This is real easy. Darnell, when I was at Blue Cross for 35 years, Darnell came in, as, started as a director, and then became in charge of everything about uh, uh, customer service. And now he is, and for the last good gosh, over 12 years, he has been the uh, regional president for Blue Cross Blue Shield. That is from Pensacola to Jacksonville to Gainesville, Florida. That is his district. He has been the past Chamber of Commerce. This man has a resume that is absolutely extraordinary. And he was brought over to assist because, candidly, he he liked Mayor Deegan. He is an administrator uh, bar none. Uh, he is so respected both in Tallahassee, he is respected uh, all over the business community, that he has received every business uh, business award there is. He's an extraordinary man. He's a compassionate man. He is a man of great spirituality. And uh, I think the city, uh, thank you, uh, Pat Garrity, for loaning Darnell to be uh, a chief of staff as a loaned, uh, a loaned uh, executive, I think is what they call it. Darnell is great for our city. I was going to say, we, we do. The city owes uh, Blue Cross um, a great thank you for this because they, they did not have to do this, obviously. And by the way, too, which you did not mention, the salary that that Darnell is getting as chief of staff is actually being paid for by Blue Cross. Absolutely. It's not coming from the taxpayers and it's not coming from the mayor's budget. It's coming from Blue Cross. And you can't ask for a better sacrifice than and that. And I can tell you, this is not the first time Blue Cross, I was also a exec, uh, loaned executive over a number of times, starting back in 1984 when they loaned me to, to help with the retention of the Supreme Court justices. This is not the first time that Blue Cross has stepped up to be a corporate, good corporate citizen. Actually, I understand that they were kind of upset because you actually went back to work for them after you got <laughs> well, to there, there was a concern that they asked me if I could work for the court, and they said, one, he's got to be competent, two, it would help if he was a lawyer. Okay, over two. <laughs> I, didn't listen, listen, my bad. I didn't give up my badge. That's what I did was. Hopefully not. Let's let's close out this part of the program by showing letting letting uh, Darnell really have the last word. When Howland opened the finance committee meeting, he said something in the very beginning that Darnell waited until the end of the meeting to address. Let's roll those two pieces of tape. I come from the business community, and um, I was sponsored and and um, uh, or rather uh, uh, supported. Um, by much of the business community in my election. Um, so I reached back to the business community to ask questions from time to time. And one of my questions was about three or four weeks ago, is this city council leaning too far forward on the administration regarding the single source contract and, and uh, the um, executive overreach? And the answer consistently was no. Mr. Chair, you began uh, the conversation today uh, indicating that uh, you reached out to several members of the business community. And, uh, essentially, my takeaway was that they're urging you to continue to do this work because it is the right work to be done. Um, I want you to know I, too, reach out to the business community. Um, and I am telling you, it is clear in the minds of many that anything to have an impact on this mayor, to slow it down, her down uh, from being able to do good work, to embarrass her, to be able to embarrass folks in her, um, on her staff, um, is just something that we just got to stop. I'm encouraging you. Uh, whatever you're looking for, it doesn't exist. We simply want to do good work, and we're asking you for your support and collaboration to allow us to do that work. And please stop 
these type of shenanigans. They don't, they, they, they don't serve us well, and they will not allow us to do the work that we need to be doing together. Well, now, even though this show is really going quickly, quicker than I thought it was going to go. <laughs> God, can um, you believe it? I know it. We want, to, uh, we want to spend a few minutes and take some time to pay honor to one of the great Jacksonville residents that we have had who recently passed, and that's Betty Holsendorf. I knew Betty, but not nearly as well as the two of you knew Betty. So I'm going to leave the rest of the program up to both of you to give us some background on Betty and some of the highlights and great memories that you have from her years working with JT. Or to put with this in city. context, let's start with Mike Tolbert because because of his, his working with Betty and Jake, and then I'll pick it up from there. Mike. Well, actually, I, I first I first met Betty when I when I was an aide to Tanzler, and Betty was in the Human Resources Department. Wow! And it was pretty obvious that she was a cut above most everybody. She was smart, she was witty, and she was tough as nails. And so when Jake became mayor, I recommended that he bring Betty up on his staff, and he did that. Made her city council liaison. Betty was one of Jake's very favorites, and she she was so good, so on top of things. So she studied so hard that she could tell council members everything in about about legislation that she was dealing with. And she even had members of the general counsel's office come to her and ask her what her thoughts were about certain pieces of legislation or explain what this bill means to you. Well, what, what, what are we trying to accomplish here? And she could do it. So they were in all of it. Uh, I love Betty, and as many people did. I, over the years when she decided to get in the legislature, I handled her messaging and media in her campaigns. And, Thank you. Uh, she, she worked extremely, extremely hard. And then once she got elected, she never looked back. She nope. was just something else. I can, I can remember when Jake was running for re-election in 1983, um, we had Bill Hamilton and Bob Squire. Bill Hamilton was the pollster, and Bob Squires was the analytic media and the advertising, both of them out of Washington and very well known. Jake's opponent was a guy named Harold Gibson, a black man who had been an aide to Tanzler and also who had been on the city council. And I want to read you from my, from my book about what I wrote about what Betty did back then. A few of Godbold's top, well, first of all, they, they, let me go back. They said that, that Jake should not campaign in the black community uh, because he would, in doing so, he would make uh, Harold Gibson a martyr out there. And that infuriated a lot of us, especially Betty. <laughs> a few of Godbold's top black aides, and I vehemently disagree, Betty Holzendorf, who was Godbold's highly respected, very aggressive, and extremely intelligent council liaison, went ballistic. She, a couple of other black campaign leaders, and I met with the mayor and presented him an ultimatum. Olsendorf said, you've served them well, you've kept your promises. Now they have to make a choice. If they want to support Gibson, let them do that. We give them a choice. Then Holzendorf banged in the nail. If you're going to take that advice and not campaign in our community, we're going to resign. Wow. That was Betty Holzendorf. Wow. Actually, Jake didn't take a whole lot of convincing <laughs> because he loved campaigning, and especially in the black community. <laughs> You and got that right. My memory is that he went out there and kicked Gibson's ass pretty good. I think we got about seventy percent of the vote out there. <laughs> we could tell stories about her. I, I could. John Payton, when Jake was in his second term, John Payton, who would become the mayor, was an intern in the mayor's office. That's right. And Jake assigned him to Betty, <laughs> and I, I think it was probably like going to graduate school for John in politics. PhD. He, he would, <laughs> yeah, he would tell the story that Jake would come into Betty's office with a, a bag of boiled peanuts, and they would sit there and eat boiled peanuts. John would be sitting in the corner watching all this. they sit there and start eating boiled peanuts and cussing about which councilman was doing what to whom and or what they were going to do to the next guy, whose ass they were going to kick tomorrow. <laughs> and John said, but then when they were done, they'd pick up the phone and call whoever it was they were cussing and invite them to lunch. <laughs> and he said, I learned a lot about that. <laughs> so, but the good news is to me that, that uh, 
not the good news, the bad news, sad news for all of us, but the good news for St. Peter and everybody up there. Uh, Jake and Betty and Denise are all together again. So I, I salute her. I miss her. Uh, I appreciate her. And uh, boy, those memories are just amazing for me. With that trio, by the way, I do feel very badly for the good Lord because he's got a real tough way to go if he's going to try to saddle those three. I, I, well, I, together. I, I posted after her death, I posted a thing on Facebook that said, watch out, St. Peter. Yeah. <laughs> well, before that. I talk about her in Tallahassee, I, I, I was thinking, you know, she's up there. He's up, Jake, Denise, <laughs> uh, Senator Holzendorf. And Ed Austin, I'm going, oh, let me tell you, God is now take a case called Mother Teresa and said, you got it for a while. I, you know, I'm, 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 I am due a vacation. Tag team match. Yeah, it was. And, and, I'm not sure, and I'm not sure he's coming back anytime soon. I, I want to pick up on what Mike said about what Betty brought to the table. Now, when Mike talks about how and how she did her job and the expertise that really puts into context of why Betty went over the first is a house member in part of being one of 120 mm -hmm. and is a Democrat at that time. So you had to stand out in order to be heard at that time. She understood the budget. She understood parliamentary procedure. She also went over there with an agenda. And, and as I shared with the two of you, Yesterday, I had the opportunity to go to attend Betty's funeral, mm -hmm. first the night before, and then I went yesterday. And I will tell you, I have been, unfortunately, to, to too many funerals, but to see and to hear all that she had done for her community, what she had done for Jacksonville over decades. I mean, as Mike said, it went back. Her commitment to education or commitment to kids, it, it didn't just start when she was in the legislature. What I heard from Mike and somebody else, she went over there with Jake and all, and I guess with Tanser. She knew what she was going to do. She knew what she needed to do. And in talking with Mike Talbert and what I heard yesterday, let me tell you, it didn't matter who she reported to. She wanted to make sure that her community got what it wants. Let me fast forward to Tallahassee. So she's in the house. She makes a name for herself and people were in awe of her. Now she was from Jacksonville. So let me put this in context before I get to the Senate. So being Jacksonville still, when she went over there, we were still pretty much the insurance capital of the world. Mm. Well, if you kind of think of all the big buildings in town, a lot, as she would say, when they would talk about raising taxes on the business community or whatever they were doing, and whether it be the Democrats or the Republicans, she would stand up and, as Mike will tell you, she would point her finger <laughs> at whoever was chair. And she said, I don't want you messing with those buildings because in those buildings, my people work. And I don't want you messing with that because you're messing with their job and you're messing with opportunities for their kids. So don't go there. Ooh. Fast forward, she runs from the Senate. And she gets there. I'm going to tell you, I, we watched it in awe. Again, she referred to the insurance industry because so many throughout the state of Florida, so many of the workers, so many of the employees in the insurance industry came from her community. And she was incredible. But I will tell you what, where her, where her strength was. And I, and Mike can, will probably come in on this part. Betty understood the budget process. We, they, whether it would be the Democrats or the Republicans, we would pass a budget was in the billions of dollars. And when you, they would bring it out, they had so many days, it would have a cooling off period. And it would come into a book that could be anywhere from six, six to eight inches wide. Betty understood that. And what she did every time it, the budget went to the Senate, she would have the previous year's budget book, previous year's budget sitting on her left and on her right would be the present budget. And what she did was she would take uh, stickums and they were color coded. And what she could do is find out what had been in the budget the year before, mm -hmm. what was in this year's budget, what wasn't, what was, if it was increased or increased. You had senators and staff members who would come to her who would say, now explain that because she was the only one who really read the budget. Now, because of that, let me tell you, what we would call in politics, she had political chits. 
So it made sure that what her legislation was going through, Betty could negotiate. And let me tell you, she knew how to negotiate. She knew how to keep score. And let me tell you, Northeast Florida, but the quality of life in education, child care, those things, they came out because Betty knew how to do this. Would you not agree, Mike, on understand the budget? Yeah, and you know, I just listening to you, I tell her. I was I was surprised. I, if you, I'm sure you guys were too. The, but the great respect that she carried somehow caused the governor, DeSantis, to lower flags, the state building flags in Jacksonville, to half staff in her honor. Uh, I thought that was pretty damn amazing myself. It was it was brought up and not overlooked at the, at the funeral yesterday. Was it? Right. And it was a bipartisan funeral. It was extraordinary. Uh, and the other thing, that other thing, I got to tell you one other quick story. The respect that she had for uh, first responders who were there and being represented. The other thing that she had, one other thing, and Mike, I got to tell you this story. The other thing that Betty could do. Betty was a great cook, and the other uh, the other qui- the other arrow in her quiver, uh, before great meetings or things like that, she would spend all night cooking all night. She'd bring it into the committee meetings, you know. And as they say, an army uh, runs you know runs on its stomach. Yep. On those key committees, she provided the food, and over breaking bread. Uh, there were deals cut. <laughs> she knew how to work a crowd. She knew how to do it. And she was beloved. And I, I don't remember, to Mike's point, I don't remember the last time, and it's been a number of years since Betty's been there. I don't remember the last time that state flags were put at half mask for a senator who's been gone as long as she has. That, that shows exactly the impact that she has had on the state of Florida. And God rest her. She, uh, she was our friend. Uh, and she looked after me. I have to just tell you, she made me a legend in my own mind. I miss her and I loved her. Well, as we say in my religion, uh, to, you know, and that is, uh, you know, may her soul be blessed amongst all those who uh, who loved and admired her. So, yeah, we uh, we will all very much miss her. What did she do after she left the Senate? I'm surprised she never went into lobbying. No, you know, you got to understand well by that time, everything. you got to understand his family was important to her. Yeah. And, uh, you know, her kids. Well, King, was, get, King was on the council. King was I on was the there. council. She, yeah. And let me tell you, she was, she helped. One of the things that came out yesterday, there were a number of, of our uh, 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 council folks of color who were there, past and present. And they all got up and said, let me tell you, when we ran for office, Betty is the person who, I, if it hadn't been for Betty Holzendorf, I wouldn't have been there. And one of the things, and, and Mike's, I thought Mike was going to go there. She said, I don't worry about polls. You work until the polls close. You don't worry about polls. And she, every one of there were four of them got there and said, I was a lot. We had to work, get out the vote until the polls closed. You didn't worry about polls. You worked it. Yep. I bet she's very proud of Kevin too. She was, oh yeah, she was proud of all of her grandkids. And the neat thing was, uh, Kevin uh, Kevin was one of her favorites. She had, she had so many, I mean, it was just extraordinary, but, uh, Kevin finally, Kevin, I can't believe he, he's 30, he has three kids. Yeah. Uh, but his oldest son just had a baby girl and the middle name is Betty. Wow. And oh, it was great. extraordinary. There were, there were not many dry eyes in that, in that, uh, uh, at funeral yesterday, but the respect from so many people from all over the community, uh, black, white, uh, Democrat, Republican, the love, respect, and admiration they had for Betty. She was a fighter, but she loved our town. And uh, it'll be a long time since we see another Betty. Yeah, we certainly will. Any God final thoughts there, Mr. Tolbert? Yeah, I'll, I'll close it out with this, Mr. Miller. Going back to that 1983 campaign when, when she stood her ground and said that Jake was going to campaign out there or we were going to all resign. You fast forward to the end of that campaign, the election night. Uh, we had a big party at the campaign headquarters, and and Jake had done so well uh, in, with the black vote and the black community, and, and Betty had, and the others had worked so damn hard. So when she arrived, I remember this so well, when she arrived at the campaign headquarters for the celebration, 
It was like a sea of people party <laughs> for her to come in and were applauding her. And knowing that her husband's name was King, that's when I started calling her Queen. <laughs> because she, cause she, to me, was a queen. I mean, she absolutely was a queen. Very good. Mike, you just yesterday, that's how they referred to her, by the way, yesterday. As queen. queen Betty yesterday. There you go. It was, it was, it was one of the most moving uh, experiences that I've ever had, ever. It was just incredible, the amount of love and admiration that were in this huge building yesterday. It was extraordinary. Well, thank you both, by the way, for bringing all these stories up because no, uh, there are things that I never heard before in this program. So I appreciate it, Mr. Tolbert and Mr. Hightower, for reliving those days with all of us. Appreciate Mike and it. I, Mike Tolbert and I both feel very blessed that Betty was part of our life's journey. You were very fortunate. And you yes, were very we were. fortunate. Very blessed. So, 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 Mr. Miller. Yes, sir. Tell us who's next week's guest is going to be. Well, next week's guest, uh, and I'm going to get these. I'm going to get these missed up. I believe Mr. <laughs> Pantazzi is next week. Is that correct? If I'm not mistaken, that's right. Pantazzi. Okay, Andrew Pantazzi will be back from the tributary. We're going to be going through a few of the items that he's been writing about lately, and then the week after that. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this program as well. As you know, the handkerchief dropped to end the session up in Tallahassee here. And the sun was still out, believe it or not. Believe it or not, no earthquakes, no No, no, no it didn't nothing. happen until midnight. But was, That's true. They did do it. They got to go home for lunch. Wasn't that something? Yeah. Anyhow, we're going to go through the legislative session and take a look at all those bills that will be impacting Northeast Florida. And we're going to have uh, Mike Bender back with us for that to uh, go Mike. through that with Dr. us. Dr. Mike Bender. Dr. Mike Bender, okay. Okay. So we hope that you'll tune in for all of these programs. Our thanks once again to the Jacksonville Historical Society. Thank you. Mike Tolbert, thank you very much for joining us from the barn. Mike Hightower, always a pleasure to have you here. And uh, please catch us next time on your favorite platform where you get your favorite podcast. Have a good week, everybody. Y'all right. stay there. Thank you. Mike's on Mike with Mike Tolbert, Mike Hightower, and Mike Miller can be found on your favorite podcasting platform, Facebook, and YouTube. Visit the website at mikesonmike.com. Join us next time for more conversation with Mike's on Mike.